Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How are you? Pretty good. Good, good. Hey, man, it's the first day of summer, so it's finally going to warm up around here. Oh, is that right? I didn't realize today was the first day. Oh, well, it is officially the first day of summer, so we'll finally get some warm weather. <laughs> well, we need it, let me tell you, because... <laughs> yeah. Because oh, it was only 95 or 96 today, I think. <laughs> yeah. I actually thought it was cooler today than it has been the week before. It might have been. If it, it, we're still I mean, having, it's still hot. Like, yeah, we're still having, most people wouldn't call it cool, but for here, yeah. it's cool mornings. Yeah, yeah. Um, that yeah, we will, we will hit a point where... Like at six thirty in the morning when I'm walking out the door to go to work, it's, it's already like, ninety degrees. I'm already sweating. Yeah, it's already <laughs> like, ninety degrees, and it's only going up from oh there. Oh man! Um, yeah, prepare for three more months of ninety-eight degrees and one hundred percent humidity. It's going to be a fun one. Yep, yep, yep. Oh. Can't wait till fall. <laughs> exactly. Uh, oh. There, there are certainly drawbacks to living here. Yeah, it'll be here for you now. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, on the bright side, the pools are open. Yeah. Yeah. That's always. I, I got to really try and take advantage of that this year. Yeah. Do I some, I do must some never swimming. take advantage of my my uh, area's pool system. That's a good workout, swimming. Oh, absolutely. Which is why I need to take advantage of it. Yeah. Um, you just got to find the right time to go. You don't have to deal with kids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there is the oh. one pool that has. Um, no kids allowed. No, I wish there is. There isn't that. <laughs> There's not that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they have a lane or two designated for lap swimming. And oh, swimming. okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. Uh, at Swim and Racket, they have a lane or two designated for lap swimming. Yeah. Um, or they have in the past. I yeah. assume that they still do. But even then, like, you can't go in the middle of the day because it's overused. There's yeah. several there's like people a line trying to get. Yeah, there's several people lap swimming, and the whole rest of the pool is filled with kids. You kind of got to go like later in the day when yeah. people are taking their kids home for dinner and to like try and put them to bed or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> whatever people do with kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh. So then you can maybe get out there and get a few laps in. But by then, like, by then the water's warm. Because yeah. it's been all day, mm-hmm. and you know, kids been peeing in it and stuff. <laughs> oh, and the sun. Uh, the, yeah, there's that too, right? <laughs> um, so I don't know. I I have tried to go out there a few times in the in the pa- in past years, and I, I've done a little bit of swimming, but I really want to try and like make it a more habitual thing. Yeah. This year, because I like swimming, yeah. and it is a good workout. It's a good workout. That's for sure. And I haven't done enough of it. Yeah. Maybe I can get somebody to pay me to teach them. Because I like to teach them swimming, too. <laughs> that's probably going to be kids. And it would be, yeah, but then I'm in charge. Oh, yeah. So that's a different scenario. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Then I'm an authority figure to those kids. Oh, uh, okay. It's not the same as, like... <laughs> Trying to send, swim around on my shirt. <laughs> wi- yeah. <laughs> sending telepathic wishes to parents to get control of your kids. Um, <laughs> it's not the same thing. Uh, I hear you. So, uh, I don't know. And income stream. Ah, you can you put you can tolerate a lot more when you're getting paid for it. This is very true. <laughs> yeah. Just think about your job. And how much you want it or not want it. Yeah. <laughs> and how, like, what your paycheck looks like matters and how much you want it or not want it. Yeah. Regardless of everything else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, I... I was actually going to talk about this before. We're definitely not spending much time on it. All right. But um, there was a bit of a controversy in Alabama uh, because the winner of the National American Miss pageant in Alabama, um, Sarah Milliken, is like 350 pounds if she's, yeah, (laughs) easily, (laughs) easily 350 pounds. Roll Tide. Um, it got a lot of flack because people kept calling her Miss America. Oh yeah. And so in some ways I wanted to, uh, to set the record straight for people that didn't look into this any further. Yeah. Um, it's not Miss America. 
Yeah. It's not Miss USA. It's not even a beauty pageant. So what what pageant did she win? It's the National American Miss pageant, the NAM Alabama pageant. Okay. Um, and it's the the winner winning is based on a positive self image and personality and communication skills, which also makes you wonder if you've read any of her like Twitter posts or anything. Doesn't seem to me that this girl has great communication skills. <laughs> they <laughs> are like full of. Uh, syntactical and grammatical errors and it's like it's awful um that's how kids this, to the, these days post and it you know i i don't i don't want to body shame much much <laughs> but, but you're there, gonna <laughs> but there is a point yeah. where it's probably deserved yeah like i'm sorry this isn't healthy yeah. and the fact that you have such a positive self-image to win a pageant <laughs> at this size, I think is actually a little bit of a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that maybe you should be, instead of embracing the you that's unhealthy, like maybe try and fix yourself a little. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Do she, something about it. She won. Take Ozempic. She won the pageant. That's true. Which, yeah, encourages this, which is even crazier. Yeah. And on that same line, actually, uh, Oh, by the way, I learned some interesting things <laughs> about this, this pageantry yeah. while I was reading about this stuff. Because then I, I know nothing it, about the pandas, like, page, pageant street, how, how pageantry 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 scene. Uh, I'm, um, it's not a scene I'm on. I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole on this, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was reading some commentary by a um, uh, a Miss Alabama, an actual Miss Alabama, because this is <laughs> the uh, real thing. Yeah. This is an attribution that they were giving in some media. That's wrong. Yeah. I mean, that's how I saw it posted. Yeah. So multiple the, times, like it yeah. wasn't even just like once, like, yeah. So the, the Miss America, Alabama is Miss Alabama. Okay. Um, and Miss, uh, is she attractive? Miss USA? Probably. <laughs> probably. Uh, so you yeah. didn't go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> no, no. I mean, that one actually is a beauty pageant, so I'm pretty <laughs> sure she's probably attracted. There were, of the five finalists in the National American Miss pageant, three of them were really attractive, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this girl won. We went a different direction. I guess here. they didn't have a positive enough self image yeah. um, or good enough communication skills on Twitter. It's hard to say. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah. So, Miss Alabama is actually the Alabama win winner of the Miss America state thing okay um and then the other big one would be miss alabama usa okay so the miss usa pageant they add usa at the end so miss yeah. america gets miss alabama or whatever the state is yeah. and miss usa gets miss alabama or whatever the state is followed by usa so miss alabama usa okay All right. so I, this is so, this so, is very important titling apparently to yeah, some of these women. So yeah. well, it is if you follow that sort of thing, I, I would imagine. Yeah, I suppose so. Or if you worked hard enough to, I mean, yeah. As I understand it, the the women that compete in these pageants at the high level like really bust their asses. Well, I'll tell you, like, so I, you know, I had two girls, have mm -hmm. two girls, yeah. um, and we dab. <laughs> what happened to them? <laughs> yeah, no, they're still here. <laughs> um, <laughs> We dabbled in the pageant thing when they were young. Both of them, I think, at different points did different pageants. And that was never a scene that I wanted them involved in at all. Yeah. After seeing it with um, my youngest starter, the first go around, uh, our oldest starter, the first go around, I was like, dude, this is this ain't where I want my kid. This is garbage, man. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they, I mean, it is super serious. Like, yeah. I mean, these moms are like, like pageant moms is a thing, dude. Like you stay away from them folks. Yeah. I'm pretty sure there was a, a show on TLC or something. There was. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of my daughters was watching that show a while back and it was like, but like, I mean, I watched some of that. I was like, dude, I don't want no, I don't want my kids part of this. Like, I don't want to deal with it. This is, this is crazy folk. Yeah. So just saying. Well, in other pageant news, um, Miss Maryland, which yeah. is part of the Miss America pageant. Okay. Um, Miss Maryland, uh, Bailey Ann Kennedy is mm. her name. Yeah. Um, Bailey Ann Kennedy is a trans woman, uh, Cambodian American. Really? Um, 
I will I will say at least for this woman that she at least she's a high effort tranny. Because oh, yeah. if they hadn't said that she was trans, I would not you have wouldn't known. Have, you wouldn't have picked up? No. Um <laughs> Oh. But and <laughs> my favorite bit though was that she said after she won uh, that she quote I f- I felt confident in my own skin at thirty one because that was another big thing too she's thirty one years old she's that's like kind of old oldest for that people. yeah yeah, yeah. Um, to win one of those things yeah. uh, but I thought that it was funny that the trans person said that they felt comfortable in their own skin because isn't wasn't that kind of the <laughs> that's problem? the whole situation right I don't know. <laughs> I, um, I'm confused Ooh. but then I I thought like. You could actually see in the video on that one, like one of the finalist girls that didn't win, that lost to this trans woman. Yeah. Uh, her face changed completely <laughs> when the announcement was made. I bet. And I thought, like, how how horrible is it for these women that have worked so hard at this yeah. to lose to a biological man? <laughs> Yeah. So, in one of these things. It's a very strange world we're living in right now. Yeah, it really is. And and then I was thinking about some real sexist stuff because I was thinking, you know, like, aren't you women tired of this? Yeah. Well, a lot of them are. Like, there's there's plenty of women that are speaking out against just this sort of thing, particularly in sports. Like, it's a big deal in sports right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I was just thinking, like, uh, ladies, if you're afraid of the um, confrontation or whatever, like, we can take care of this for you. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, we've been told to stay out of this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So if you want us to stay out, that's fine, but you're going to have to do something about it yourselves. All right. <laughs> we can handle it if you want us to. Yeah, right. <laughs> you're not wrong. So, um, anyway, yeah. I, and I was talking, I like something you said, by the way, high effort tranny. Like I like that. <laughs> that well, I've seen a lot of low effort. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, that may, immediately made me think of the low effort and I was like, yeah, that's yeah. a term I'm using now. There's a, there's a high effort and there's a low effort. <laughs> yeah. At least, at least she looked like a woman. Hey, that's fair. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, if, if you're going to do it, do it. <laughs> I, I can't help but think that there had to have been a real woman that was a more attractive woman than the high effort training, <laughs> though, in that competition. Uh, um, one would think, but... Yeah. Uh, anyway, she's also married to a Marine Corps officer, apparently. I don't know. Yeah. I bet he's one of the favorites in his squad or something. I don't know. I, like, <laughs> that, that's kind of a Don't weird, ask, don't tell, right? I suppose. <laughs> that's over, though. It? it is, Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I guess that that's a way to get yourself bumped up in the military these days. No, probably. Oh, well, I'm married to a trans person. Yeah. Uh, makes me... <laughs> Sign this guy up for a promotion. Yeah, oh, <laughs> DEI stuff all the way around. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's why he's an officer. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Hard to say. Um, anyway, it, it was strange, though. And uh, and I was talking to somebody else today about this about this sex and gender thing. I I said we weren't going to spend a lot of time on it. But, but here we are spending to. a bunch of time on it. I mean, it's just it's such a weird... Yeah. This is such a weird cultural thing that we're dealing with here. And I remember when I was in college. Like, it started in academia. Yeah. Right. Well, it always does. And I remember when I was in college, um, and I was studying anthropology. Now, I did mostly biological anthropology, so I did a lot of... Uh, primatology and comparative anatomy and, you know, a lot of lab work and so forth. But um, human evolution stuff and what have you. But I, there wasn't enough purely biological anthropology for me to get enough credits yeah. at, at the school. So I took, I took many cultural classes too. And uh, I remember the use of the or the designation of sex is biological, gender is cultural. Yeah. But it was really used there as a shorthand to talking about gender roles. Yeah. They weren't really saying that that gender itself was culturally defined. Yeah. They were saying that the gender roles were culturally defined. Yeah. Right? Like it was just a shorthand for gender roles. Yeah. But out in the rest of the world this has been taken to mean that gender itself is culturally defined. And so therefore you can define yourself however you want. That's, that was never the intention. I don't think. Yeah. Um, 
And the idea that you can just define your biological sex because it's, I, I don't know. It just, it's, it's just wrong. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I don't know what else to say. Like there is a biological reality. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, almost everything about not just us, but every sexual species is kind of defined in this dimorphic way. Like, mm. That essentially our procreation is absolutely defined by a gender binary, yeah. a sexual binary. There are only two things. It's XX or XY. There are mistakes that happen. Sometimes you end up with the XXY. It's like, you know, but these are very I was rare. I say that, that don't happen often though. These are very rare genetic mutations and our entire existence as a species is actually dependent on <laughs> binary sexuality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we're trying to pretend that it doesn't exist. And it's, and it's not to say that people can't live their lives however they want because they can, yeah. I, you know, you live your life however you choose. I'm not taking away your choice to, to act as in whatever gender roles you please. Yeah. But the idea that you're actually making some kind of change is well, just a fantasy. I, for me, it's it's that it doesn't have to be celebrated, like, and that's really where my problem is, and that's yeah. where my problem, as far as where society is heading, <clears throat> is that, like I say, I mean, do whatever you want, and I don't care, like, it, it, you do however you mm -hmm. feel, but I shouldn't have to like celebrate it. Yeah. Like, and it doesn't have to be like thrown in my face everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like I say, it's, I mean, do what you want. Not like I say, I don't care, but yeah. that's, that's really where, where it kind of grinds my gears. Grinds your gears. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's, uh, and pride month bothers me too. This whole idea that just because I don't have a, like, once again, like I said, I don't have a problem with any of this stuff other than like, like, I don't care who you have sex with. Yeah, like, like that's and that's, that's kind of your private yeah like, situation. Uh, like you don't need to have just don't, do it out in front of everybody. Yeah, I just don't want to know. That's my issue with the pride parades is that they're like okay, celebrating your um whatever sexuality. I guess that's fine, but like there's a lot of displays that are actually perverse. Yeah, going on in public. Yeah. That you couldn't do that anywhere else in yeah. public, and it there not be consequences, and and shouldn't <laughs> you shouldn't do that type yeah. of thing, and like it's just not it's I don't know, and I'm not like a prude or anything. I just don't I just don't care to know and see about all of that. Yeah, like I have no interest. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which is why I don't go to the pride parades. Obviously, I yeah. I have no interest. Yeah, yeah. Um. But the, yeah, the gay thing doesn't bother me at all, actually. I don't yeah. care about homosexuality well, one no. wit one way or another. Um, the trans thing is something different. The trans thing is different. That's that's true, too. And I, I still come back to going to have to talk to the doc sometime if if I get the opportunity and just say, like, we're talking about a dissociative disorder. I just don't understand how the answer to the dissociative disorder is to encourage the person to dissociate further from reality. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Further from biological reality. Like, again, I say live your life however you want. I don't understand. This is the thing that really gets me about it is that a, a lot of it comes from the left and it's the same people that push that say that, um, you know, that, uh, the gender roles don't mean anything that you don't have to be this way or whatever. But then if you act contrary to what the stereotype of your gender is, then you must be the wrong gender. Yeah. Like, no, there's just an infinite number of ways of being a woman. Yeah. <laughs> like if, if you don't fit into, you know, the perceived stereotype of a woman, that doesn't mean you're a man. It's just another way of being a woman. I, it, I, I don't yeah. understand how that how, why the push is that there's something that you were born in the wrong body. Like how stupid does that even sound? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like stop and think about that yeah. for a moment. Anybody that's pushing this agenda, stop and think about that statement for just a moment. Yeah. 
Like, no, yeah. your entire biological reality is built around sexual dimorphism. Like, yeah. everything is different. And which is why, even if, even if you've done a complete transition as a, uh, as a male to female, if you've done a complete transition, you've had it cut off and everything, like the whole complete <laughs> transition, yeah. you still can't fairly compete with women in sports. Yeah. Because for a long portion of your life, you were still bathed in male hormones. Your body was built differently. Your muscles are denser and like yeah. men and women are built different. Yeah. They, they just are. I mean, you, you can't avoid the biological reality of the differences in sex. Yeah. Which is the reason we separate men's sports from women's sports. Mm -hmm. Because if it was if it was integrated, it'd just be men's sports. Yeah. And uh, yeah, exactly. Most <laughs> of them, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, like I actually think that women's gymnastics is more entertaining to watch than men's gymnastics. Oh, men's see. gymnastics is more impressive in some ways. Yeah. Like the feats of strength and balance done there. Yeah. But like the agility and balance of the women's gymnastics. Oh yeah. I find no, I, uh, you're, you're right. Gymnastics would be the one that the women would dominate. Yeah. But it, but they would include if they kind of mixed the the various events that they do, yeah. then it would just be that women dominated some of them and men dominated some of them. That's true. Yeah. And uh, my brother was saying, like, I don't understand how this is so difficult. Why can't you have for sports a men's category, a women's category, and an open category? <laughs> you know, like, right. why is this so hard? Yeah. Uh, well, and then the open category, you let anybody who wants to participate, participate. So you yeah. can be a man, you can be a woman, you can be in between, whatever. <laughs> yeah, like, you can be non-binary, whatever that yeah. means, and yeah. so on. Um, I actually think that'd be pretty interesting. Uh, for some sports, maybe it, it, just to have like uh, just it would ju basically be just an integrated sports. Yeah. So like, which would what would happen is that it would be dominated by mostly. biological males. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. you know, whatever. At least I guess that's fair. Yeah. At least it would. Yeah. Well, at least it would be competitive. Sort of. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> um. Oh man. I, you know what prompted this conversation today? Uh that I had about this was I was talking about um, my, my mom was encouraging me to get involved in boy scout skin, you know, like I'm an Eagle scout. Yeah. Um, there have been times as an adult where I, actually there were times when I was a young adult that I was a scout leader. Um, and there have been times since then that I've considered getting back involved as a scout leader, but now the boy scouts isn't the boy scouts anymore. It's integrated, right? Yes. It's now integrated. And I thought, what a disaster that's going to be. So, but when my mom was talking about it, I was like, oh no, the situation has changed. Yeah. Um, as a single male, it is now dangerous for me to be involved in an in a uh, co-ed scouting thing. Yeah, I hadn't even um, thought about that. Like but. the idea of going on camping trips trips with uh with teenage girls just seems incredibly dangerous to yeah, to me you know. because all it takes is one accusation. Doesn't matter whether I did anything or not. Yeah. Which I wouldn't because I'm not oh, a terrible yeah. person, but, um, one accusation and yeah. my life's over. Yeah. yeah. And so you already it, had a problem. Worth the risk. Yeah. yeah. You already had a problem of male scout leaders <coughs> molesting teenage boys. Now you have that same problem with teenage boys and teenage girls, and you have teenage boys and teenage girls together. together. <laughs> Like yeah. this, who thinks I could this have is done gonna... that when I was in scouts? Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. Well, <laughs> just saying, yeah, that, that's also what we said. And I was like, that's exactly why it can't be right. Yeah. <laughs> you just illustrated the point. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and I, I get it. Like there's a girl scouts is still girl scouts. Yeah. Um, but girl scouts and boy scouts don't do the same things. Yeah. But why is it so difficult that, um, that if there are teenage girls that want to do the things that Boy Scouts do, that they can't form their own organization to do those things. Yeah. There's... They had an episode about that on Parks and Rec. It was really good. Did they? Yeah. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Leslie created her own Boy Scout troop. And then all the Boy Scouts and the Ron Swanson one like went and joined it. <laughs> oh, oh, I do vaguely remember that. Gosh, i got to watch that show again. Oh, man. Yeah. It was great. All right. Great we... illustration of what you just laid out. Yeah. There's so we spent way too much time on that. Um, 
Uh, we spent like half an episode on some diversionary stuff, which, <laughs> which not is not what time. we sat down to talk about. Yeah, exactly. I thought we would spend like five minutes on that. Uh, you know, we can't, we can't spend five minutes on anything. That's probably true. Um, okay, so we've got some we got some foreign policy stuff to catch up on. Ooh. And we're going to have to do it quickly now. Because <laughs> <laughs> you wasted all your time on. <laughs> I know. On su- or, stuff that does or, not matter. On gay shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Cursing more than we're supposed to this <laughs> podcast the last few weeks, by the way. We're get, we're Rain getting, it in, man. Get, it's I, you. It is me. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, let's start with um, Israel. Yeah. So. Is there still war going on there? Uh, it seems to be. Okay. Um, Biden proposed uh, a plan. I, I don't know. Occasionally they said it, they say it's the Israeli plan. Um, Mm. so, and I think that's really so that it appears that it's, uh, Hamas that's getting in the way of enacting the plan. But in actuality, Biden proposed a a three phase plan where the first phase of the plan was going to be a six week ceasefire to negotiate a permanent ceasefire to be implemented in the second phase, but all hostages would be released and so forth during this phase. Um, Netanyahu, from his office, said that there would be no permanent ceasefire until Hamas is destroyed. Yeah. Well, he said that over and over again. Yeah, and he said that since this peace plan was Has proposed. He? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, and in fact, uh, let me let's play a clip here. This is a okay. clip from Max Blumenthal. He, he, you know, he knows this as well as anybody. Yeah. Um, and uh, and he's he talks about. Uh, he talked about on on Judge Knapp's podcast recently about Netanyahu and this, and and really what it comes down to is Netanyahu would lose his government if he agreed. Okay, I mean that he doesn't talk about that particular aspect of it in this clip. He did talk about it, but yeah. um, it there's been he's being attacked from his right flank on this. So yeah. even if he wanted to agree, he couldn't because he would lose his power. Yeah. So, um, but this. Let's listen to this Max Blumenthal clip. This is enlightening. Okay. Netanyahu's office is saying there will be no ceasefire until we achieve all our goals, which include militarily rescuing all the hostages and defeating Hamas entirely. We will not end the war. So there cannot be a permanent ceasefire as long as Netanyahu is in office, as long as Netanyahu is stating that. And now, to, and then what Tony Blinken and uh, and Sullivan constantly say is it's all on Hamas. But if you actually listen to what Hamas has been saying, and they're saying this publicly, they're saying it through the Egyptians, that they have only offered minor alterations, and the only thing that they demand is a permanent ceasefire. Um, it, it 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 reminds me so much of the negotiations after Oslo in which they would never set a timetable in which Israel would have to set borders and they would say, we'll just keep negotiating, but we're never going to permanently end Israel's settlement project, its expansion. And here they're saying, we're going to have six weeks and then we're going to negotiate a permanent ceasefire. Do you actually think based on Israel's history, does anyone actually believe that they will honor that? There's no precedent for it. And Netanyahu is explicitly saying that he won't. So um, let's unpack and add some detail to some of that. All right. So once the proposal is made um, that there will be a six-week ceasefire during which uh, Hamas will give up all its leverage in in the form of the hostages. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, during that time, now the U.S. has said the ceasefire will remain in place until a new agreement is worked out. Um, but like Max Blumenthal said there, there's no reason to trust the Israelis will ever follow through. And what they have said is that the, um, that they will withdraw from populated areas, which means that they're not even withdrawing all their troops out of Gaza. Yeah. They're, they're maintaining a military presence in Gaza during the ceasefire. Yeah. And there's always the opportunity to, for something to happen 
to trigger some kind of response from Palestinians and say that that was a breach of the ceasefire and so they're going back to war or to fake it. Yeah. I mean, they or, you yeah. know, something really could happen because you, you still have forces in the area. There's always the chance of some conflict erupting. Yeah. Well, as long as um, as long as they're occupied, there's yeah, yeah. that's going to happen. And so by Netanyahu saying that there would be no ceasefire until their um, their goals are reached, which includes the destruction of Hamas, um, you have incentivized Hamas not to agree to the deal as it stands, but to seek further guarantees, which is what they've done. Yeah. And that's what they're talking about when they say that, you know, I mean, Blinken said it's something like, well, they, they altered the deal. Uh, and so, you know, it's all Hamas's fault. All they had to do was say yes. But what they're doing is they're saying yes to something that's not really an agreement. Yeah. And so what Hamas has asked for, like Hamas has just sought guarantees um, that the release of hostages would ensure a permanent ceasefire, not a temporary ceasefire. Because again, that's their only leverage. I mean, think about it in like a prison because it's actually pretty analogous. Yeah. Um, The prisoners in a prison have no leverage unless they capture something that belongs to the, you know, capture a prison guard or whatever. Yeah. Right. That's the only way that they have any leverage over the power structure is by taking something that's important enough because they have no inherent power in the relationship. Yeah. Um, So if, if they give up all their hostages, they're just like the prisoners demanding something without any, any, bargaining material yeah they get nothing they have no power in the relationship to begin with so there's no incentive for the the powerful to give them anything yeah unless they have something to receive in return yeah so um and then the the other thing is that they wanted the complete withdrawal of israeli troops from gaza and uh they wanted that um that the prisoners that would be released by israel uh, they wanted guarantees that the prisoners released by Israel would not be rearrested. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that's what they, that's how they've altered the deal yeah. is just trying to ensure that they actually have something, they get something permanent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I don't think is unfair. So, but all the statements about how Hamas has rejected a deal that was essentially their deal and they're not negotiating in good faith and so on and so on. Yeah. It's just not really true. Yeah, because that's uh, that's been the narrative in the mainstream media. Mm-hmm. Like that's over and over again is what you hear. They're not negotiating in good faith and blah 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 blah. Yeah, so it's Israel that's not negotiating in good faith, as has been apparent by the statements from Netanyahu's government. Yeah, um, that essentially saying that they have no intentions of of granting a permanent ceasefire. Yeah, and yeah. that they intend to achieve all of their goals, including the destruction of Hamas. Yeah. Which I go back to it, like you can't destroy an idea. Yeah. Which is which. Any time I hear them say that that you know we've got to root out Hamas, we've got to destroy Hamas. Like you're you're talking about destroying an idea and an idea that's in people that that have been oppressed for decades and decades now. Yeah. Like I mean, most of them have grown up in the under the suppression. Yeah. So I mean you're not gonna root out the idea that they don't like being oppressed. Yeah. Well you can't root out that idea anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah. well, that's my point. Like yeah. you know, so something else I heard um some interview with one of the hostages freed hostages or something recently mm-hmm. somewhere. I wish I remember where I had heard of that. But um the thing that just struck me was the guy was saying that he was um when when they were like being held cap- captive what they were worried about was the israeli israeli bombs yeah like that was that was where the fear was at like they did, he wasn't actually worried about i mean they the hamas people needed them them you know mm-hmm. they they weren't worried about hamas killing them they were worried about the israelis dropping bombs on them yeah and so have you heard anything about the Hannibal Directive? Have you read anything about the Hannibal Directive? I have not. Okay. There's actually been some, this is something that, uh, again, Max Blumenthal and some others were reporting yeah. um, from the very beginning. Uh, the Israeli Defense Forces have uh, a clause in their operating procedures or whatever um, called the Hannibal Directive. Okay. Because they don't want um, 
the Palestinians to gain any leverage in in the form of hostages. Yeah. Uh, there, the Hannibal Directive says that the Israeli defense forces should kill any Israeli military men that are captured by Hamas rather than let them be taken. Really? Yes. So you're talking and, about like picking off your own folks? Yes. Wow. Um, and there has That's been some, some evidence come out recently through UN um, investigations and so forth saying that at least a dozen Israelis on October 7th were killed intentionally by their own forces. Wow. Um, and there's also been uh, evidence to suggest that they had applied that Hannibal Directive not just to Israeli military personnel, but to civilians, but to civilians during the October 7th That's attacks as wild, well. wild, man. Yeah. Um, um, and this isn't just coming out of nowhere. Uh, there, the, like the Hannibal directive exists. Yeah. Um, there was good reporting on it at the time. And now you've got some corroborating reporting, uh, through the UN, yeah. um, as well. Uh, just to add to that, the UN and the New York times retracted their article quietly, um, have also, uh, reported from their investigations that, well, the New York times retracted their article because of the UN investigation, but, no. um, the claims of mass rape and so forth. Yeah. That there's actually zero evidence. That was all just made up. Of, of any Israelis being raped by Palestinians on October 7th. Wow. <laughs> like none, zero. The, when the Israeli government was confronted uh, with the investigation, they couldn't produce any witnesses yeah. um, or victims. <laughs> uh, the, it, the whole thing looks to have been just completely made up. Just trying to oversell their case. Yep. To justify a genocide or a, um, uh, ethnic cleansing in Gaza. Yeah. 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 So they got that going for them. Yeah. Uh, so that's, what's going on with the negotiations in Israel is that there will be no negotiations. Yeah. And, uh, and it's Israel saying it, um, the Biden administration actually does seem to be intent. I mean, they're going to, they're going to watch the flank of the Israelis anyway. I yeah. mean, they're going to support the Israeli government no matter what, but, um, there is a real political incentive for, for something to for change the, here. Yeah. For the Biden administration to put an end to this. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, this is a, this is a loser for the Democrats. Yeah. Um, Biden in particular, but mm -hmm. as for the other big war, yeah, um, Putin gave a speech on the 14th, which was what, nearly a week ago, last Friday. Yeah. Um, where he made a public proposal of prerequisites for negotiations. Yeah. Um, they were pretty simple. They haven't changed that much since the beginning, since before the war. Yeah. Actually, um, it required a neutral Ukraine. And yeah. just to be clear, and what he said he means by a neutral Ukraine is that it will not join any military alliance yeah. with the West or with Russia, yeah. that it will be like Switzerland. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that it will not join any military alliance, so it cannot be, and it won't hold, house foreign troops, military bases, et cetera. Yeah. Um, Which, by the way, I mean, not to try to take sides, obviously, but I mean, that's fair. Like, it's not unreasonable for Putin not to want all of these bases and, and military stuff on his border. No more than we don't want it in Cuba. Yeah, like, well, it is the same thing. The reason that the West has tried to control Ukraine is to prevent it being a military base for Russia. Yeah. So they, the West understands this desire to not have Ukraine used against them. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it it's just... It's astonishing to me, and it's it's just our hubris that has brought it to this point. Exceptionalism. Yeah. Yeah. It's the idea that we're special. Yeah. Is a big part of it. Um, okay, so next thing is that, uh, that recognize Crimea is a part of Russia. Okay. Of course, it has been since the, you know, 18th 20th. century. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Seventeen. I think it was in the 1780s that uh, Russia first established their naval base in Sevastopol. Okay, yeah. Um, it was purchased by Catherine the Great. Yeah. Crimea was for Russia. Wow. It, it's been part of the Russian Empire for a very long time. Yeah. Centuries. So, so this shouldn't come as a surprise. 
Yeah. Um, and of course, we know that they, after the 2014 coup, um, that Crimea voted overwhelmingly to remain a part of Russia. Yeah, I remember that. And that, 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 um, that vote has been independently verified by polling by third parties after, afterwards. Yeah. Like the aligned with the election res- or the, um, voting results. Yeah. So probably legitimate. Yeah. And even if it's not legitimate, the polling says that that's how it would have fallen anyway. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So, um, and then finally, um, they said that uh, the sovereignty of the um, republics of Donetsk and Luhansk and the uh, uh, regions of Zaporizhia and Kherson would be respected, uh, that they are now part of the Russian Federation um, through their votes and will remain so, and that Ukraine needs to withdraw its troops from those regions. Yeah. Um, and, he, and he says, once that's done, he said this explicitly in the speech, once uh, Ukraine expresses a willingness to, and begins serious withdrawal of their troops and um, is uh, agrees to the uh, maintaining neutrality, that... Russia will call an immediate ceasefire and begin negotiations to settle the war completely that day. Yeah. So this could be over in a week. Yeah. Yeah. Once if it could, if, it could if be the, the fighting could be over today. tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um. Yeah. Yesterday, last it, week, yeah, as it were. Yeah. As yeah, it could have been over <laughs> over the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But the West has rejected this out of hand. Uh, saying that Putin is in no place to make any demands. Yeah. Um, but all they're doing is ignoring a possibility. It's negotiations. You yeah. you have been given a pathway to begin the peace negotiations, and you refuse to even consider it. Yeah. And it is and wild it's not because unreasonable what he's asking for at this point. Now yeah. they've lost more than they would have if they'd have made these agreements two years ago. Yeah. But I think what you just said is the is the real kicker, though. They, it's not us. We're not losing our men and women aren't dying over there. Well, that's the it's, problem. It, it's 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 you know it's somebody else's. <laughs> it's Ukrainian lives that are in jeopardy here, um, and and the Americans us are more than happy to watch you know Ukrainian men and women die for uh, for nothing, essentially. Well, that is the that is the important point. If in this country, and I see Ukraine flags all over the place. Oh, yeah. If in this country, in the United States, you believe that you want to support Ukraine and you care about the Ukrainian people and the nation of Ukraine, then this is a godsend. Because yeah. this is the best thing for what's left of that country yeah. is to end the fighting now. Yeah, because no matter how long this goes on, they won't defeat Russia. No, it can only get worse from here. And if they had if they had gone along with this agreement that was interrupted by the West two years ago, but yeah. if they had gone along with this agreement, first off, they would only lost Donetsk and Luhansk. Yeah, um, and they those two places wouldn't those regions wouldn't have become a part of the Russian Federation. They would have become independent republics. Yeah. You wouldn't have lost Kherson and Zaporizhia. Everything else essentially remains the same, except that in that time, you've lost three or 400,000 people and a tremendous amount of infrastructure. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. nation has been destroyed mm-hmm. in the intervening period. This all could have been avoided. And yeah. you can't tell me, no matter what you think of Putin and Russia, that yeah. this is better now than it was before, or that it will be better if they just keep fighting. Yeah. Yeah, there's no, there's no win in that. Like, I mean, it, it, it's I mean, just, even if you could win, how much more do you have to lose? Yeah, yeah. What would winning even look like? I mean, if you it, let's just say like somehow they did like repel Russia, and Russia was finally like, we just can't do this anymore. We're going home. Mm-hmm. You didn't really win. The country is destroyed. Yeah, you've lost all of these people for. I mean, it's just even if do you know how many more 
human lives it would take to drive Russia out of Ukraine at there's, this point? There's no telling. I mean, as I mean, it, it, I mean, how we, many more we, people are worth it? Lose we, another million people? I mean, you've went through the numbers on this podcast before. I mean, it's just not going to happen like that. Yeah. But just saying that it magically did, like they, if Russia just packed up and left it would tomorrow. Take some magic. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Where's um, Harry Potter when you need him? There you go. Um, no, it's it's just it's it's stupidity all the way around. And and this whole situation has really, it's. It, We've been the whole idea, I think, from the U.S. side is, well, we're going to really hurt Russia and and bleed them down and bleed them dry. And I mean, if you look around the world, that just hasn't really happened. I mean, China's rallied to them and Uh, they've been negotiating with North Korea now, too. Well, that's what I was going to say. Putin was in North Korea this Mm -hmm. week. Yeah. Um, And yeah, they signed some kind of pack and that type of thing not that north korea is the great power of the world or anything but but there is starting to grow this alliance i mean if anything um russia and north korea being closer together doesn't help us any yeah like all of these countries that we've we've put all these sanctions on and have punished for all of these years are all kind of starting to band to impact together um it just it feels like it lays the groundwork for, for something world war one Except yeah. for three, for I yeah, mean, but the, the, the third the, iteration, yeah, the the series of alliances that that yeah. one little incident creates a world war, yeah, um, before, exactly. Before we wrap this up, I do have uh, uh, some commentary from Jeffrey Sachs on this from, from okay. Professor Jeffrey Sachs that I want to play, yeah, um, and so let's play that now, and then we'll wrap up the Ukraine thing, um, and then I got one more little issue that I think is worth talking about. All right, you know, Russia never territorial demands on Ukraine up until the coup that overthrew Yanukovych in 2014. As I said, they didn't make territorial demands on the Donbass. They didn't make territorial demands on Crimea. With Crimea, they were satisfied with a 25-year lease of their naval base. That was enough. Just leave us alone. Then came the coup. For seven years after the coup, Russia did not claim that Donetsk and Lugansk were part of Russia. Russia didn't seize them. Russia didn't annex them. Russia didn't claim all claim these territories. All that Russia said was that they should be given protection and autonomy based on a treaty that Ukraine had signed and that France and Germany were guarantors and that the United States had backed in the UN Security Council called the Minsk II Agreement. This was another Western cheat. Okay, there was a weird cut at the beginning of that clip that I don't know how that happened. <laughs> but the word that you missed was made. Russia never made territorial demands on Ukraine before the 2014 coup. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we talked about the Minsk II agreement before. Uh, we have seen, and of course what he's talking about at, at the very end, he says that that was another Western cheat. It's because since then, um, the... Uh, the president of France from the time and the president of Germany at the time and Angela Merkel um, have all said that it, they were never intended to follow through with the Minsk II agreement. It was just a way of buying time so that they could continue to arm and prepare Ukraine for a war with Russia. Yeah. <laughs> Which just says that, that we've wanted this the whole time. Yeah. Um, there was for some reason. Like. <laughs> I wish I kind of wish I'd pulled this clip, but his accent's pretty thick. But uh, Sergey Lavrov is a real seasoned diplomat. Yeah. Like he he might be one of the best in the world at this point, which is hard to believe because he's a you know he's the foreign minister for Russia, and they're not they're kind of in the doghouse as it were. But yeah. um, but he's talking about uh, there he had some recent commentary where he was talking about like uh, about trust, and he's like, you know, you don't have to trust us. And frankly, we don't trust you either. Yeah. But there's we're offering a pathway to end this thing. And shouldn't we just talk? Yeah. Well, and so that that goes down to my whole one of my whole issues with this. And what's to me the scariest is that like we don't talk to Russia at all. No. Um, there's been no um discussion between Biden and Putin about this in two years. 
Yeah, I mean that's two and a half years almost. Now. That's insanity to me. Yeah, I mean the closest thing we got was Tucker Carlson going over there. Yeah, like I mean that's and he was he was vilified for and it. he oh absolutely he was. I mean there's no this and and that should scare everybody listening to this that that the, these people all of the stuff is going on the the world's on fire and there's the two people who have the most control over the situation which is Biden and Putin haven't even been in a room together. I don't think Biden's whole presidency. No. Well, they did meet on the sidelines of some did they? thing once, I think. Before the war? No. But they oh. refused to talk about the war. Oh, did they? Okay. Maybe that was Blinken, though. Might uh, have been Blinken. Uh, maybe. Blinken, who I hope goes down as the worst Secretary of State in history. <laughs> well, he's, somehow, making, he's making a strong case yeah, for it. Yeah, somehow worse than Foster Dulles. I don't know how he managed... <laughs> But I think he made it. Yeah, yeah. Number one. Wow. <laughs> Foam finger number one. <laughs> yeah. Um, just incredible. The, oh. And and again, the West has dismissed this out of hand, um, including Jens Stoltenberg, who uh, is the head of NATO. Just like, and they, they're saying the same things, which is Russia's in no position to make demands. But yeah, they really are. Yeah, exactly. The the fact that you don't want to accept that is is separate from the fact that like they're winning this war. Yeah, like, they're what do you not think going, is going to lose to this from here. Yeah. And and the only thing that can the only way they don't win this war is if everybody loses. Yeah. And I'm yeah. talking about a nuclear exchange. Yeah. And and so there's a Well that's that's driving it down though to the worst case scenario. Yeah. I mean the fact of the matter is is what's gonna happen is is the stalemate is just gonna persist. Yeah. And it's gonna get and it and the only person who really loses that is the Ukrainians. Well, that's like the, true. the Russians, while this isn't probably great for their economy, mm-hmm. it's not destroying them. Like this yeah. isn't sinking. It's actually the ship. doing more damage to Germany's economy than it's doing to Russia's economy. Exactly. Like um, the, and Putin does talk about this in his speech and I, it's long, it's like 10,000 words. Yeah. Um, from the guy who read it. Yeah. I, I read the whole speech, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's worth reading. I mean, he goes into a whole lot of detail about the history, yeah. um, about the attempts that Russia made to avoid this. Yeah. Uh, he mostly is talking about the history beginning around the Maidan coup in 2014, till the present he doesn't dwell on the hey we were made assurances in the 80s and 90s that nato wouldn't expand and they lied to us yeah um he he mentions it but he didn't dwell on it he spends a lot of time though on the history around the 2014 coup when Um, when as far as he's concerned things got serious yeah um the uh the civil war that was going on you in ukraine since then that we pretend wasn't happening yeah um, and then, uh, the attempts that Russia made to avoid war and the attempts that they've made to conclude it peacefully. Yeah. I mean, I say peacefully to, to conclude peace negotiations since the war began, um, yeah. that have been rejected by the West. It's worth reading. Um, you can find our, a good translation in English on the, <laughs> on the Kremlin website. Yeah. Uh, the Kremlin website actually publishes all of the speeches in English. Yeah. Um, <laughs> They want us to hear it. You can find it. Uh, there's another uh, translation that came out more quickly. The official translations on the Kremlin website. There was a an earlier translation that came out on Russia's Sputnik um, newspaper. Yeah, uh, that you can read it there too. I recommend people read it. Yeah, I mean, take the time and read it. Like, understand where this guy's coming from. Yeah, because not everything he says is quite right in there. Yeah, but a lot of it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if nothing else, like try to understand his perspective because his perspective actually is very reasonable, which is essentially it boils down to we need to have international agreements where everybody's security is considered that yeah. people don't we don't in, um, we don't enhance some nation's security at the expense of other nations security. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems reasonable to me. And I mean. and that's that's what we should be striving for. But the the United States, particularly in the West, kind of in general, because of the military power and the economic power that they wield, feels like that they can make demands on everybody else. Yeah. 
Yeah. That everybody else should just kowtow to what the Americans want because, hey, we've got the military might to back it up. And while that's true to some degree, it it's, that's not acceptable to some people. Well, yeah. I mean, there's at least, I mean, Russia is the largest nuclear power in the world. Yeah. They don't have to just do whatever we say. Yeah. And if we can't come to some kind of agreement, everybody loses. Yeah. Which is not what we want. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know that we're running long here, but I, I did want to, there's a couple other things. One more related to Ukraine. Okay. Um, it's that the, we have now speaking of that economic power that we wield against everybody. Okay. Um, we made, or the West collectively NATO or whatever. I don't remember how they subdivided it, but, um, made a $50 billion loan to Ukraine backed by Russian money. <laughs> Yes, that has been frozen and seized in yeah. European and American bank systems. I just the logistics of that just and I've I've heard it laid out logistically how they're doing it. Mm -hmm. It's just, I mean, it's more than my little brain can comprehend. Yeah, essentially, what they're saying is that the um, the assets have matured, and so Russia's assets are protected, but the institutions still control the money. And so they're still using that money to invest and earn more money. And the more money that they're earning is what's going to be used. So yeah, Russia still has the, everything that they so contracted it's, so it's for. So it's not froze, though. Right. Because if it was the froze. The institutions still have the money and they're using it to do other things. Yes. Right. Exactly. I, I mean, essentially what they're saying is banker theft isn't really theft. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, because they do that to you, too. They I just do. want to point out <laughs> that for everybody out there that has money in banks, they're doing the same thing to you. Yeah. They're using your money to earn more money, and you have no right to the money that they earn off of your money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not necessarily opposed to that. I, yeah. I think that there has to be an incentive to the bank to hold your money and keep it secure for you. Yeah. Um, at the same time, they don't do that to people with a lot of money. Yeah. People with a lot of money earn interest off their money. It's less than the bank is earning off their money, but at least they have a right to some of the proceeds earned from their money. Yeah. And I think that we all should, but that's not what we've all contracted for, right? Like yeah. that's, you know, that's just not part of the deal for everybody. Yeah. Should be. <laughs> Maybe you should demand that next time you go try and well, find a new bank. Dude, but, the deal with the banks, it's wild to me. Just a quick aside on that. So on top uh, of the banks earning money off the money that's sitting that that I've got sitting in my bank, a lot of these banks nowadays want to charge you a fee for inactivity in the account on top of that. So you can't have money just sitting in an account. They want to charge you five, ten dollars a month to do that. Well, at the same time, they're lending out 90 cents off of every dollar that you give to them and earning interest off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I walked out of a few banks the last time I opened an account before mm -hmm. I found one that wasn't going to do that. Yeah. Um, so anyway. I need to move my money actually to like a, a bank bought my old bank and the agreement has changed. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's how I ended up in the situation I was in where I was bank shopping. So yeah, I, I, I should do that too. Yeah. Anyway, um, aside. So, yeah, essentially the the claim by Janet Yellen and others is that banker theft isn't really theft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but what this does, though, is that it undermines the very economic system that we have used to profiteer, really, yeah. for decades. Oh, yeah. Um, it incentivizes uh, nations to find other arrangements. Yeah. Just like you find in a bank that like just like i yeah. like you're fixing to do yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and other arrangements are out there i mean they're starting that these countries are all starting to kind of it goes back to what i was Rick's saying is expanding it's now uh, a larger part of the world uh gdp that or gm g whatever the world revenue world, world yeah. production than um than the uh u.s system is really so, yeah. yeah yeah these uh like I say, the dynamics are changing. and World economy? I don't remember how exactly they're breaking that down. It, it's really scary to me, though, that, that our leaders um, don't seem to recognize this. Yeah. Um, and, and don't care. That Just think that we have the power and we can do whatever we want. And, and the world's changing. Mm -hmm. um, we're so long now, but I'm, I'm not going to not talk about this. Oh, actually, we're not that bad. I, I kept... You can't I, I see a, good. Yeah, I have a weird glare off of the 
the screen. So I thought that we were over an hour and we are with the clips actually, but yeah, we can go a little long. Yeah, no, this is fine. We're fine. All right. Um, there's a CNN debate coming up. Oh yeah. And, uh, it's going to include Trump and Biden only. Oh, no RFK. No R- RFKJ. And let me explain why, because this is a fun one. Oh, yeah. Um, so th- to qualify for the CN- CNN debate, uh, CNN required that the candidates um, secure ballot access in states whose electoral votes total 270. Didn't matter which states, but as long as the they had to have a path to win. Yeah. The electoral votes had to total to 270, which is what you need to win. Yeah. Right. Um, and that they had to get a poll at 15% or greater in four quote unquote reliable. Yeah. National polls. Hmm. This is one of the tricky parts right here. Yeah. Right. So who defines reliable? As far as I can tell, CNN didn't say, these are the polls that we consider to be reliable up front, which means that they get to pick and choose after the fa- after they see the polling results. <laughs> exactly. Now, I don't know that that's the case. I just couldn't find any list where they said, this is what we consider reliable national polls yeah. in, in advance. Never agree to, if you're ever running for president and there's a possibility that you could end up in debates, don't agree to something that they don't, they don't list exactly what it is that yeah. you need. Uh, But that's not even the messed up part, because according to CNN, Kennedy um, polled at 15 percent or better only in three reliable national Hmm. polls. So he didn't make it. So it was just that close. But that but that wasn't it. Yeah. The the interesting part is that um, ballot access in enough states to total 270 electoral votes. Yeah. Now, Kennedy's campaign, and this is probably true. Uh, I can't independently verify this, but it, it's probably true. Kennedy's campaign says that they have satisfied ballot requirements in 22 states totaling 310 electoral votes. So he's on the path. Over the path. CNN says that Kennedy is on the ballot in six states totaling 89 electoral votes. <laughs> now... Where are they getting their math from? Because most states have not finalized their affirmations on the ballots. Okay. The, well, then that so case, the fact the, that, that he, he has qualified, but it hasn't been affirmed by the state, yeah. means that they're not counting it. Well, they just shouldn't count Biden or Trump either, then. Exactly. And do you know <laughs> how badly they shouldn't count Biden or Trump? <laughs> well, let me... Uh, because neither Biden nor Trump have officially received their party's nomination. Yeah. So in actuality, neither Biden nor Trump are on any state's ballot (laughs) right now. Yeah. That's wild. They are on zero state ballots because they have not received their party's nomination. Yeah. They're the presumptive presumptive nominees. But they are not actually, if we're going by official recognition, they are not officially on any state's ballot at this time, yet yeah. somehow they have qualified, and RFKJ has not. That is wild. Uh, it shows you just how crooked the system is, mm-hmm. um, even for something like this. Like, yeah. It's meant to be exclusionary. They yeah. don't want RFKJ. Well, and it, it would, RFKJ would make a fool of the both of them. Oh, yeah. I, like. I'm not a huge I mean, support. I, I like RFKJ. I do too. Um, I'm not a huge supporter of RFKJ. Like other than, other than the Vax thing at this point, he doesn't and Ukraine. He's still cut on Ukraine, but um, yeah. other than the Vax thing, like medical freedom and um, getting out of Ukraine, yeah. there's not very many issues that we agree on. Yeah. He did give a good speech at the LP convention. Um, yeah. about the Bill of Rights, that he would support the Bill of Rights, every word of it. I appreciate that. I mean, that's yeah. more than most presidents are going to promise and certainly more than most presidents will follow through with. Yeah. I don't know that he would either. But yeah. um, that that's better than the alternative yeah. to in a whole lot of ways. Yeah. That said, it's meant to exclude him. Well, it, what irritates me is that they just don't come out and say it. The, yeah. This whole like, well, we're going to set all of this up in a way where you can't 
can't achieve it. I mean, they, they ought to just come out and be like, hey, look, we're going to have a debate between Trump and Biden and screw the rest of y'all. Yeah. I mean, that's basically what this— At least it's this, more honest, right? At least it would be—yeah, exactly. But, but I mean, we're talking about CNN. I was fixing to say, but look at who Nothing they do is honest. <laughs> exactly. So. I, uh, yeah, I, I, just, I just found it interesting that he, since not enough states have affirmed their ballot totals, his uh, placement on the ballot— that he's excluded, but the two guys that they have there actually aren't officially on any ballot in the United States right now. It's insanity. <laughs> Funny. Insanity. All right, so that's the last thing I wanted to talk about. We can wrap up now. All right. Um, so, uh, let's see. This is, this is, yeah, I think we're good. Yeah, uh, next week should be good for me. I'm yeah. going to be out of town some, but I should be back in time to podcast. Okay. So. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I won't see you earlier in the week. No, nope, you won't. All right. Well, you, yeah. Okay. So that's fine. Um, Thursday or Friday? Are you back Thursday or? I, either of those days seem to work for me. Okay. Cool. So. Well, we expect to be, regardless. Yeah. Of whether it's Thursday or Friday. It'll be one of them too. We'll be back next week. Um, in the meantime, you can follow us on uh, Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, uh, like and share, comment leave reviews, criticism. You can always email me at Michael, the Liberty Mike.com. It's Michael at the Liberty Mike.com. I kind of <laughs> ran that all together. It sounded yeah. like Biden there for a moment. <laughs> mumbly, mumbly joke. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. And we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. In the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.